We'd like to take a minute to thank our sponsor, Cash App. Cash App has been the number one finance app on the App Store for almost two years. It was also the first major peer-to-peer payments app to support Bitcoin, and it's still the fastest and easiest way to turn cash into crypto. Cash App now supports Bitcoin deposits in-app, so be sure to move your Bitcoin from whatever wallet you're using to Cash App. Don't have any to deposit? Cash App is also the most convenient way to instantly buy and sell Bitcoin. No more waiting five days for your ACH transfers to come through. With Cash App, you can buy Bitcoin instantly. When you're ready to take full ownership of your private keys, just use Cash App to scan an external wallet's QR code. It's really that simple. Cash App also comes with standard banking features like direct deposits and others your bank would never even consider, like Cash Card a customizable debit card that lets you instantly save every time you use it at Lyft, Whole Foods, and places like Chick-fil-A. It's also a favorite of the block's analyst, Steven Zhang. He saves money at Chipotle every time he gets a burrito. That keeps Steven happy, that keeps the block happy, and that keeps the crypto world informed with the best news and research in the entire market. Download Cash App today from the App Store or Google Play, and I hope you enjoy the episode. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in to what is a very special episode of The Scoop. I'm your host, Frank Chaparro at The Block. We are going to be joined today by Sam Bankman Fried. He is the CEO of FTX and Alameda Research. They are a research uh, liquidity provider and derivatives exchange, respectively. And he's going to help us explore the divide that we're witnessing here at the block between the derivative markets in the United States and North America and those in Asia when it comes to cryptocurrency and digital assets because they are shaping out rather differently. And Sam, uh, you and I had a conversation, I think it was either a week ago or or two weeks ago, about how all these products are coming to market differently right and we see these headlines in the news about x firm launching options or y firm launching options but they're not all the same and so i think the best place to start is 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 right there um when you think about the way the derivatives market for crypto is shaping up do you see there being a divide as well or am i off base yeah and i think there is sort of a divide but even more than that I think that there is sort of one side of the divide that right now has all the volume. And so, you know, I think that you do see a lot of different structures showing up in, you know, generally in sort of U.S. and, and, you know, American-like exchanges versus global exchanges, predominantly Asian ones. Um, And and I I think you see that across the crypto space in a number of, uh, of ways. But I think, you know, especially given how active derivatives are right now, I think that's one of the most prominent ones. Um, and, you know, you sort of see the, the U.S. crypto derivatives market trying to shape, you know, in a way that is modeled after how the CME works. You know, that's modeled after how, you know, Wall Street is used to operating products. Um, and then you see these, you know, foreign and, and there's sort of a lot of words you can d- use to describe being called foreign, Asian, global. Uh, they're all sort of, you know, vaguely accurate um, exchanges which sort of take a very different approach to things. And, and it, it feeds through into everything from how the products are structured to how funding works and how you move capital around uh, to who the users are and the interface and the failure cases and, and everything else. And Yeah, 100%. I think just taking a step back, we're in this stuff every day. Um, me, not the same extent as you, but just to lay the landscape for some of the listeners who aren't following this pedantic corner of the crypto market as closely as Sam. Obviously, in December, we had back launching its options on futures. They already had their cash settled futures product. OKX, another an Asian exchange, or as you say, maybe a crypto native exchange launched their Bitcoin options. Uh, FTX launched Bitcoin options earlier this month along with CME right at the same time. So clearly we're we're seeing a lot of activity, right? And the bottom line in terms of what 
is different about the two markets boils down to liquidity, I think. And you're you're absolutely right. When you look at the first day of trading for backed, I think 50 contracts traded versus your first day, 3,000. Aside from liquidity, when you look at the structure of these products, can you draw a similar uh, divide or make similar comparisons to what we're seeing in Asia versus the U.S.? You noted modeling after the storied uh, exchanges like CME. Yeah. And, and I think that there are a lot. And I think one way to, you know, one sort of another divide that shows up here is with sort of the, you know, the global Asian exchanges, there's sort of this philosophy of like, you're a random person who wants to trade crypto. And within like 10 minutes, you should be fully up and running. Now, maybe you're going to take it slower, but that like every piece of the system needs to be up and running immediately for users. There isn't this long, you know, it's not just that there's a long onboarding process, there isn't a long transferring your funds process. And, and to sort of go through this, you know, let's say that you wanted to start trading uh, on the CME. You know, you want to trade Bitcoin futures or maybe, you know, gold futures or, any, or anything else. Like, what's step one? Well, step one, you have to get some accounts somewhere. And that's going to be sort of a long process. And if you actually want to trade directly on it, you've got to be like a, a giant multinational corp corporation. If you're just sort of a random user, you're going to go through like a few middlemen to get there. Um, step two, act gone through a lot of due diligence. You try and get some funds there. So you send this wire transfer to this big production to your bank. And like a few days later, you can do your first trade. Um, and it seems very clunky from the perspective of like a person trying to do their first trade. Um, whereas with, you know, a lot of the Asian exchanges there, the philosophy is like you – Go to the URL, you have an account in five minutes, you know, to the extent you're doing KYC, you can have, you know, the bulk of that done in half an hour, and then you can get your funds there within an hour. And then you're sort of fully up and running with exactly the same setup as, you know, the most sophisticated player in the industry. And that's a pretty stark difference, and it flows through a lot of aspects of the product. And the way of phrasing here makes it seem like one's just better, like, you know, obviously the global way is better, the U.S. way is really clunky, but... There's a flip side of this, which is, you know, okay, now say that you're Goldman Sachs and you want to be trading a Bitcoin future. How do you trade, you know, an OKEX Bitcoin future or, or a BitMEX or, or a FTX Bitcoin future? Well, first of all, you got to figure out how the blockchain works. Then you got to figure out who the hell is holding your funds if you're sending to one of these exchanges. You got to read all these docs. They make no sense. The, the API seems wacky. Um, you, you know, it's hosted on Amazon instead of like a real, you know, server somewhere. You have to figure out how to connect to that. You have to build a whole new system. Then you got to figure out how to like send some tether there. Then you got to turn into ETH Classic to trade it. And it's this whole big crypto process, which a sophisticated crypto trader is used to just clicking through in minutes. But as a big corporation, it's a totally foreign process, which seems scary from every aspect. And in fact, some parts of it are kind of, uh, you know, fairly risky. Whereas if you want to trade a CME product, well, you've already got, you know, $50 million sitting with Merrill Lynch or JP Morgan uh, in, you know, as their clearing firm in an account hooked up to every major, you know, traditional exchange. You want to trade a new CME product, you just add that, you know, to your list of tickers that you're trading, use the same pot of capital that you have sitting in a bank account that you're trading everything else with, and you're good to go. And so sort of one of the structures is very much designed for like, you know, crypto native traders, retail traders, and to be up and running quickly. And the other is very much designed for sort of Wall Street institutions to be able to easily and, and sort of, uh, see, you know, seemingly like safely interface with. And, and the bottom line there is you have two different client profiles, right? You have one that is yeah. used to connecting up to the FCMs to CME systems, the Wall Street world, so to speak. And then you have the crypto native players who are used to interfacing with an exchange like FTX. Um, the interesting thing about FTX, right, is that you have that RFQ based system. And I remember when we spoke last time, you, you described it as sort of being simpler to spin up. You have more flexibility in the way that you can trade these options. Um, Describe that flexibility and how that maybe puts you at an advantage or disadvantage to Deribit, which obviously has the order book based method, yeah. which 
which might be better for things like modeling, et cetera. Yeah. And yeah, I think there are, there are pros and cons to each. So the way that FTX options work, you know, FTX futures are like other exchanges. There's your standard order book. But for options, rather than having order books, we have this RFQ-based system where basically a customer comes in, they say, I want to buy an 8,320 strike call expiring in a week. And, you know, they type that in. And then anyone who wants can sort of show them an offer on that. And then they can trade against the best offer if they want. And... You know, the advantage of, uh, of this system is it's extremely straightforward. You know, if you want to buy that 8,320 straight call expiring in a week, you just type in exactly what you want. You click get the best quote and you get the best quote. Um, and similarly, if you're a liquidity provider and you're trying to figure out where should I be making markets, you don't have to guess every single possible instrument. You wait till a customer comes in saying, I want this option. And then you compete with other liquidity providers to provide the best quote there. So it's a really clean, straightforward way to accomplish options trades. Um, and that's the thing that I really like about it. Whereas, you know, you look at an interface, you know, the standard options chain interface, like what, you know, Deribit or, or you know, LedgerX have, and you see this, this screen with like 300 buttons on it and, you know, a million different order books, all of which are illiquid and none of which are exactly what you wanted, but somehow there's still too many of them. And no one knows where to be providing, no one knows where to be taking. And, and so that's sort of, you know, the, the way to phrase this that, that looks good for what FTX is doing. Um, and, you know, on, on the flip side, sort of the, the drawback of it is that you don't have clean market data coming out of it. Sure. Like you can't just say like, oh, I wonder where all these strikes of options are trading right now. Let me go look at the mid price of these markets and that's in the, order to and figure out. What, and that's the right. issue there, right? I mean, people like to compare. So if I was a trader, you know, who, who's yep. looking to shop around at foreign options exchange, you wouldn't necessarily be drawn to FTX because, as you said, you know, you can't easily see what it is roughly trading at. That's right. And I think that, you know, there, there's sort of, you know, pros and cons to each of them. The reason that I like what FTX is doing for options and the reason we're doing it for options but not futures has to do with the liquidity. In particular, you know, uh, relative to other things in crypto, there's a lot of liquidity in futures. It's where the majority of the liquidity is. And so you sort of absolutely have the ability to say what price is every future in the world trading at, where are they trading relative to each other, what's the liquidity look like, now let me choose the best one. With options, it, they're sort of the least liquid part of crypto right now. Like, you look at these order books, they're really wide. Um, they're wide everywhere. They're not deep. You can't get much size off. A lot of things are going off in bespoke OTC trades. And so you, you can sort of get this market data from looking at these options chains, but it's not super robust market data, no matter what you're doing. It, it's pretty thin. Um, and comparing these order books, they're all going to look kind of weird and wide and slightly different with each other. Um, and, and sort of the options market is, I think, not in crypto is not mature enough to support liquidity for, you know, 500 different options. On the flip side, um, and, and so that's sort of why, you know, I, I sort of don't want to try and have liquidity providers split their liquidity between 300 markets. They, there just isn't enough to go around. And then customers will be left choosing between a bunch of bad options. And, you know, I think it makes sense in the current environment to concentrate on what people are really looking for. Um, the flip side of this is that, you know, there is a lot of value in having real good market data for volatility. And so what we did at FTX, which is a bit different, is we have a separate set of products called these Move products. They're, they're straddles, so, so they are basically options products. But in particular, they're sort of like the cleanest options products you can have. They're pure measures of volatility. Um, and we, we just have a few of them. They're all at the money with, with basically different expiries. And so what this means, and for those who do have order books, you know, standard matching engine order book setup. And so what we're trying to do is basically say those are the products where, you know, if you want to know what is volatility trading at, that's where you can look. Like it's a pure volatility market. It, they're the most liquid volatility product markets in crypto by a decent amount, like way more liquid than you get with options by, you know, really significant amounts because it's, you know, there's way fewer of them. The liquidity is all concentrated and they're chosen to be sort of the purest the price. Um, and so if you're trying to figure out what volatility is, you look at those, whereas if you're trying to do a very specific trade in a specific set of options, you know, it's probably not going to have that much information in market data. And so instead, you know, we sort of designed a different system for that that's really just focused on executing trades. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's sort of a different perspective than where BitMEX view is. Um, I don't know if you had an opportunity to read 
um, Arthur Hayes's post from yeah. January 13th, but I think that raised a whole different set of questions. So if you, if we examine the market again, you have, um, firms like FTX that are getting into options via the RFQ model. You have the traditional firms who are modeling the way CME has been doing it for years with backed and CME, um, doing it the traditional way you have Deribit that's taking a more crypto native approach, but is doing the order book method. And then you have BitMEX, right? Which has always been the derivatives king saying, as a matter of fact, this isn't even a market worth getting in for X, Y, Z reasons. And he sort of lays out the argument that Delta One products are really all traders need right now to effectively hedge underlying positions or uh, take off some risk. Right. So um, what, would, yeah. what do you think of that um, that argument? I think it's an interesting argument. I think I agree with him on some points. I, I think that there's certainly a lot of cases where we see people talking about options where it doesn't seem to make sense. You know, there are a lot of cases where people say, oh, I got to hedge with this option. And you, it's, you're sort of struggling to see why they have any nonlinear exposure, why they shouldn't just be hedging with futures. Um, and, you know, I think that you saw this with some ICO treasuries where, you know, they tried to hedge with these complex products and it was really unclear what, like exactly what they're trying to express or do. And, and I sort of think what they actually want to do is just sell off or hedge a bunch of the ETH they held. Like that was actually the transaction that made sense given sort of where they were. Um, but instead they ended up with these like really weird books with sort of random options, hedging various parts of, of their risk profile, but not other parts in a way that I think probably didn't really reflect, you know, what they, what they needed. And, and so it, you know, I do think that people are sometimes a little bit too quick to decide that, like, they need an option instead of a future. Um, and I also think that, like, there's going to be an extent to which the biggest liquidity is all, and the base volume is probably always going to be in futures because they express sort of the, the simpler, purer idea of how much is a Bitcoin worth. And, and, and that's sort of always going to be, in some sense, the most powerful thing. And these questions about, like, well, how much the probability distribution lies in this region of the curve is always going to be a little bit more niche. And so, you know, I do think that to a decent extent, like, uh, you know, futures certainly are way higher volume now. And I'm not expecting options to overtake that anytime soon, um, which is, you know, sort of why we launched, you know, futures first. And, and it, you know, took us nine months or so to, to head into options. I think things that I maybe agree less with him on. Um, the first is that there's already a ton of options of futures products in this space. Now, a lot of them aren't, aren't that great, but there are a lot of them. There's a lot of competitors and sort of more popping up every day. And there are way fewer serious competitors in the option space. And so once you sort of renormalize for the amount of work being put into the product, you know, it, I think it no longer becomes clear that like futures are, are where it's at because that's already sort of a crowded space. Um, so and I think there's a lot of innovation left to be done on options. That, no, that's interesting. So, um, so Sam, what to what extent do you think, when thinking about the launch of this product um, and sort of piggybacking off of that point, was it a decision that boiled down to, honestly, the way we're going to construct this, we're not going to be building out order books. We, we've, we've built products. We kind of know what our style is. This is going to be easy to put together. Why not build options as opposed to, a more, I don't want to use serious because that, that, that has a certain connotation, but a more um, deeper d look for a product market fit, if that makes sense. I, I, yeah, I think that was some part of it. You know, I think something FTX has done a lot of and, and something that sort of is very much in our philosophy is try something and see if people, you know, if people want it. And, you know, we've tried that with a number of things. You know, we have future spot markets, we have fiat on ramps, leverage tokens options we have packs gold futures um and you know a lot of this is that you know we have a pretty good sense of how much appetite there's for perpetual bitcoin futures because there's a ton of them you can just look at how you know how much demand there is for the existing products but when you get into products that don't yet exist it, it's kind of hard to tell how much they're going to take off i mean maybe someone else is, is you know perfect at this but i'm certainly not and so some of what we're doing is saying here's a lot of products we can build you know, let's try rolling some out and seeing what sticks. And, you know, if, if one of them really goes wild, we'll throw a lot more energy into it. 
And if one of them gets really, you know, not very much attention, then we'll sort of just stick with version one. And I think that that was sort of how we viewed options for a while as a thing we we're pretty likely to release at some point, um, partially just to see how it goes, to see if there is demand for it, um, and sort of, you know, put a lot of work into it. If we got a lot of uptake and if they just never traded much and we never got that much interest, then, you know, leave it there for the people who want it, but, but sort of not continue to push forward on it. And, uh, and I think I felt that way basically up until we launched options. Uh, now, I think the few weeks before that, we were starting to see more and more excitement about options in crypto. Sure. And I think that made, you know, that, that sort of made us push harder on it and feel like, you know, there, the odds were higher there was going to be real demand. But really, it wasn't until they launched and traded a bunch in the first few days, you know, it's pro- you know, probably our most successful market launch since the, you know, the first few, um, uh, or at least since the move contracts. It was a successful market launch that resulted from you guys thinking, well, let's just, in a sense, throw spaghetti against the wall, see if it sticks, as opposed to people were really clamoring for this for months and months prior to launch. That's right. And, you know, we always had some people asking for it, but we have some people asking for everything. And, it, you know, it didn't sort of stand out for months and months as like the one thing everyone was asking for. but. But once we launched it, it sort of quickly became clear that actually there was a decent amount, at least, of demand for it. And, and I think we still don't know how high it's going to go. You know, I think it could sort of level off here or, or it could take another few steps forward. Mm-hmm. And so what are the volumes at around um, right now for the product? Yeah, so I think that, you know, we've been trading something like, uh, you know, somewhere between one and 6,000 Bitcoins a day of options. It fluctuates a fair bit, I think, way more than, you know, Deribits do because like, Deribit has a way more established market with sort of steady flow, whereas for us, it's a lot of people trying it out. And and so I think you see, you know, some days uh, people get really excited about them. They trade a bunch. Other days, you know, just like no one trades them. Uh, but it's been somewhere in the, you know, one to 6,000 Bitcoins that's, you know, something like, you know, 8 to $50 million of notional trading a day, um, which which we're pretty happy with for, you know, a month in. And where is this demand coming from? When you think about what the client profile is, oftentimes when we think about FTX, we we have a more retail audience in mind. Speaking to Arthur's post about the point of options, maybe not necessarily as effective for hedgers. So who then is using it? So we see a few different types of client profiles. Uh, one type is sort of relatively retail clients, and you know those look sort of how like you know you'd expect. They tend to be expressing opinions about directionality in crypto. They tend to be you know uh, sort of streams of small uh, trades going up, um, and uh, and so that's sort of one thing. And I think for that, a lot of this is FTX already had a user base, and some of those users have started using options even if they weren't trading options before. Um, so that's one type of client. Um, another type is basically um, with with sort of you know Bitcoin and Bitcoin futures. At this point, basically everyone is pricing them pretty similarly. Uh, you know, in, in moments of, of big market moves, you'll see divergences. But other than that, sort of everyone agrees to within ten bips or so. You know what a Bitcoin future is worth, um, and part of that's just because they're trading. You know. Ten billion dollars a day, and so if you disagree, you can, you can get a lot of size off on that opinion. Um, with options, they're a lot harder to price, especially the out of the money ones. They don't trade much. You, you know, there isn't a ton of liquidity, and so you get sort of diverging opinions between different players in the option space. And so I think some of what's going on is, you know, there are arbs that show up sometimes between Deribit and FTX, where you have basically you know liquidity fires on both places with different fair values, or you have clients with different profiles and you'll see a ton of taking one direction on one exchange or on the other. And so I think that there's some amount of cross exchange uh, arbitrage and, and liquidity pricing going on between Deribit, FTX and other options um, platforms. Um, and so that's sort of the second type. And then the third type are uh, sort of this this class of, of traders that that is sort of way more prominent in crypto than it is in many other uh Spaces, which you can think of as sort of the retail whale um, or the semi-institutional trader that, you know, the, the person or group of people who actually do large size, have a fair bit of capital, but it's not like a, a traditional quantitative trading firm or something like that. 
um, and, you know, tends to be somewhat directional trading. Um, and, and, you know, it, it can hit a lot of different instruments. You know, often it'll be in, in Bitcoin futures, um, sometimes in, in all coins, but sometimes it'll be in options. And so sometimes we'll also see a bunch of, you know, options going up on the tape that, that seem to be sort of coming from that profile. From your seat, um, excuse me. So from my seat, rather, it's been pretty exciting or at least interesting that all of these products have sort of launched at around the same time. And I feel like the market or market commentators and opiners like myself haven't had the opportunity to digest necessarily what this means because it all happened so quickly. Is there any major takeaway from all of these products coming online at the same time that is worth noting when it comes to either the institutionalization of this market, the maturation of this market, or should this be viewed as par for the course? We've been rolling out new fangled derivatives, you know, at a clip since the last, over the course rather, of the last one year. Yeah, so I think it's it's definitely a new step for options. Like I think it did, overall, there's been way more interest in options over the last month than we'd seen previously. And, and you know, it's sort of to be determined how that plays out and how sustained that is. But I definitely think it was signaling, you know, an uptick in interest in exotic derivatives more generally. Um, in terms of how the different venues played out, I think it was somewhat par for the course. Um, I think that, you know, you saw uh, different, you know, different implementations going up in different places. You saw almost all the volume going up in offshore exchanges sure. with, you know, CME and back you know, trading some, you know, not zero, but not nearly as much, but to a lot of fanfare and, and, and sort of the continuation of, of, you know, the, the waiting game for, for the, you know, the U S institutions to get in. And so I think, you know, we sort of once again saw U S institutional product launch, reasonable products, uh, but not, uh, you know, Goldman Sachs isn't trading billions of dollars of it yet. Um, we and, also saw, you know, that's, that's we, been true forever. We also saw a price uptick sort of correspond with this. Do you think there is any connection between Bitcoin's rally up above 9K a few uh, last week with the rollout of all these products? Is it a signal that this has attracted new market participants or maybe not necessarily? We can never know for sure. But. So I don't. Right. You never know for sure. It's all anonymous people. If I had to guess, I would guess not. It's not how it felt to me. And, and again, I, I'm not confident here, but some reasons that it didn't feel that way to me. The first is it sort of doesn't fit a pattern. You know, the pattern here is a run-up going into product launches and then a crash during the launches. And I'm not saying I, I buy into that pattern that much either, but it definitely makes me pause before endorsing the opposite pattern. You know, you saw the, you know, the original SIBO and CME futures launches, which were you know, Bitcoin quadrupled in, in the run-up to them and then crashed, you know, basically as soon as they, they launched, um, maybe because they're sort of flops. Um, so, uh, so, you know, I do think that's, that's a little bit of what, what had happened historically. This time, sort of to be frank, like the, the run-up felt not very sentiment-driven. The sentiment felt very much more run-up driven than the other way around. Um, you know, it felt like a lot of people excited because Bitcoin was going up, but not Bitcoin going up because people were excited. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it felt much more like the sort of thing that could have been, you know, traced back to some some unrelated thing or large trader or something like that. You know, there's news coming out of China around the same time. No one really knows how, you know, the you know, how the disease outbreak is, is going to be impacting uh, crypto. For instance, there is news about China's central bank and, and you know, news coming out of India. And, and so it's, it's sort of hard to trace back where this really comes from, given that often the answer is, I don't know, some guy on BitMEX, like could be anyone. Um, sure. But it, it didn't feel to me looking both at sort of sentiment on Twitter and things and also at sort of the types of orders that we saw coming across the book. It didn't feel like sort of, mass groundswell of you know enthusiasm about the product that was causing the run-up sure and I, I think that's fair again at the end of the day um we can never <laughs> know for sure there's there's um there yep. are folks out there media outlets who are always trying to tie it to something but 
Um, it's kind of a fool's errand to, to a large extent. Going back to the divide um, between East and West, and I, and I like the way you put it, global versus uh, U.S.-centric, because I think that is, um, it, it's a more nuanced way of putting it. But taking a look again at that divide, there's a regulatory element, too, that I think is interesting. And there's one executive who I talked to at one of the U.S. regulated uh, venues who describes their bet as being, you know, one day regulators around the globe are going to see what, um, and he wasn't picking on FTX in particular, but what FTX is doing, BitMEX maybe, um, to a lesser extent, Deribit. Um, they're going to see what they're doing and perhaps shut them down because they've been operating sort of outside that regulatory scope. And then that will be their opportunity then to sort of be the, the um, you know, the option of last resort, so to speak. Do you view that as, as being the outcome that we will see? I, I imagine probably not, but when, when you hear an argument like <laughs> that, what, is, um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so, you know, I, I definitely don't see it quite that way, although I think that there's sort of uh, a take on that, you know, that, that maybe I, I see more of, which is, you know, I think that the, the U.S. marketplace is an interesting one. Part of it is, an, is obviously an upside play. And, you know, I don't know if that it's going to come because offshore places get shut down. I think it's actually more likely to come if the U.S. Uh, opens up more access to crypto. And so I think, you know, the bigger factor there, instead of, waiting for foreign exchanges to die off, I think it's more that U.S. exchanges are currently significantly bottlenecked by regulation. And, you know, the fact that they can't, you know, the fact that, that there isn't a retail futures platform in the United States is uh, a significant hindrance. Um, and uh, and that, that's obviously a regulation-driven fact. Um, and so I think part of this is that it's an upside play for, you know, if and when, you know, the sort of CFTC, uh, you know, produces like uh, a definitive set of rulings on crypto that allow for a pathway for, uh, you know, the sort of uh, products that you see globally to be introduced en masse in the United States. I think that's one piece of it. I think another piece of it is an upside play uh, waiting for, uh, you know, the U.S. institutions to get in, thinking, you know, even if the other places exist, you know, JP Morgan's first Bitcoin trade isn't going to be on BitMEX. It's going to be, you know, on Coinbase or something like that. Um, and that that's a huge pot of money and a flow that, that could be hugely valuable for them, but isn't sort of being realized right now. Um, so I think that there's sort of those two upside plays in the United States. Um, and, uh, and, you know, there's, there's some market there right now as well, even without those, um, especially although, you know, it's pretty concentrated at the top, but, you know, that's also sort of becoming true of the international exchanges that, you know, the top uh, five to 10 exchanges have the bulk of the volume. Um, as for sort of the, you know, health of the international exchanges, uh, we're, there's definitely a winnowing. I mean, we've seen that a lot over the last six months, that a lot of exchanges that never really made that much sense are, are shutting down. Um, you know, the, the sort of exchanges that, that went deep into trans mining never had much volume they weren't paying for and never had particularly cool products or, or anything else and weren't super early to the game. You know, the, the, the exchanges that, that didn't have any real rallying cry are, are starting to shut down. Um, and, you know, the uh, crackdown in China kind of spurred that on for a lot of them as well. Um, and, and you also are starting to see some capitulation uh, to regulation. And, you know, I think Deribit is sort of, the clearest recent example of that where, you know, in light of new AML regulations coming out in Europe, there's sort of a two-part decision. The first was that they're going to leave Europe to not be subject to them. But the second was that they're going to start KYCing people for the first time. And I think we're going to see more of that. And so rather than, you know, seeing sort of mass shutdowns of every offshore exchange, what I expect to see is more and more exchanges moving to the model that the most successful ones have been using um, which is, you know, it's a model that Binance uses, it's the model FTX uses. It's, you know, at this point, sort of the model that uh, OKEX and Huobi use. Um, and, and, and a model that Bitfinex is moving towards as well, which is this, you know, offer products, offer, you know, a, a large suite of products to, you know, many parts of the world, um, but also have 
a real AML KYC compliance program. You know, have, especially for large traders and large transactions, you know, collect KYC information, monitor chain analysis, uh, you know, the, the sorts of things that would be, you know, obviously even more sort of tricky inside the states, but that have been standard on, on about half of foreign exchanges for a while. And Deribit sort of the first big name to give it and start KYCing, but I don't think they're going to be the last. And so I think that sort of partially out of fear of what, you know, that, that anonymous exec said, uh, you're going to see a lot of foreign exchanges starting to get their shit together, uh, or at least moving in a sort of more uh, standard direction in terms of compliance. Mm-hmm. And ir- irrespective, though, of, of whether or not you're setting up KYC, AML, when you look at the products specifically, um, to what degree do you think the CFTC w- can see something like um, a future, uh, leverage future based on a commodity um, and think, well, maybe this is something that could impact U.S. customers um, and want to get involved or or take a closer look or impede um, your own business processes? So I think that, you know, obviously, I, I don't know, and this is, you know, something we're going to have to see. I think that traditionally you've seen, uh, you know, the big question here being, are these U.S. customers? Um, and that the CFTC sees themselves as having, you know, a pretty big mandate to regulate the set of products that especially U.S. retail customers can access. Um, and that that's sort of where, where a lot of this domain is. And that they're sort of, you know, much less active in doing things like regulating global, uh, you know, offshore futures. Um, and so, you know, the first thing I'd say is that I think the CFTC, you know, if I had to guess, I would guess that they're going to be looking the hardest at products serving U.S. retail customers. Um, and and that's what they're going to sort of see as their core jurisdiction. And, you know, to a lesser extent, U.S. Uh, institutional traders. Um, and, and to a much lesser extent than that, uh, sort of offshore activities. Um, and, and obviously, it's not, you know, an extremely firm statement. There are lots of ways that these things leak into CFTC jurisdiction, especially in egregious cases. And so, you know, if things, if there's sort of a compelling enough case for for it, you know, there's always the option of, you know, talking to regulators in various jurisdictions. Um, and and so, it's, but, you know, I think that, that that's going to be looking primarily at, A, what do those jurisdictions think? And B, again, like, is there something really egregious going on? Um, that's, that's sort of the sense that, uh, that people have been getting, for now, now obviously this is a new industry and, and things can always change. Like, you know, I don't know what the answer is going to be in five years. Um, but, uh, uh, but, but on the flip side of that, I think is when you look at something like, like factor, when you look at, you know, money laundering concerns, that is an extremely global problem. And, you know, there's sort of very little sense of like, you know, Oh, you know, we're only regulating money laundering for this jurisdiction or something like that. Like it's, you know, sort of by by virtue of the nature of the, the problem, like the whole thing is is you know moving money from places it shouldn't be or to places it shouldn't be, and so in order to stop the problem, you have to take a super global approach. And so I would expect that we'll see way more kind of globalization and crackdowns uh, on the uh, AML KYC side than the leveraged you know futures or commodities trading side where that latter one is going to be more of a jurisdictional and regional thing where sort of each, each country or region is going to be working out policies for what their, you know, what their citizens and particularly what their retail customers uh, are and aren't allowed to trade. I think another interesting point, and we spoke about this on the phone uh, last time, the CFTC or U S regulators slow approach to approve regulated cryptocurrency futures here in the U.S. to an extent has probably been a really bad thing for the valuations of some of these U.S. crypto exchanges. If you think about Coinbase and Kraken and the like, if they could have gone to this business a lot earlier, you're, you're talking about the difference between a company, if we use the traditional world as a, as a model, um, the difference between being valued at 1x to, to 10x, um, just given how much 
um, derivatives exchanges trade at a premium to U.S. equity exchanges. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. And so you see, you know, on the one hand, there's sort of this premium for U.S. exchanges because of what they do have access to, but there's also this discount for them because of what they don't have access to. And a lot of that that game is figuring out how can you build a compelling enough product uh, while still staying within the realms of the the customers you're trying to target there. Um, and and you know, to, just to make this explicit, it's, it's certainly been bad for the valuations of a lot of U.S.-based crypto exchanges. I don't know that the CFTC is doing something crazy here. Like you know, I under I don't know what the right decision is from their perspective. You know, I'm guessing they're sort of sitting there thinking like, boy, this this industry is kind of a mess in a lot of ways. We don't know what the right thing to do is. Uh, we're working on it, trying to come up with some regime that we think makes sense. We don't fully trust these systems. Like we don't want to, we don't feel comfortable full on allowing them in the country. And, and just given, you know, how big of a mess this is, it's going to take a while to sort that out. Um, and, and I think that's sort of the stance that they're taking, you know, whereas a lot of other jurisdictions are sort of taking the stance of saying a lot of the same words, but the conclusion sort of being like, you know, we're going to take a long time to figure out how we stand on things and we'll be sort of trying to identify egregious things or things we think are bad along the meantime and shutting those down. And so it's you know, sort of this whitelist versus blacklist approach to some extent. I guess kind of um, stepping away a little bit from the, the regulatory conversation around options and derivatives, you mentioned that folks are always asking for new products. What are some of the products that they're really clamoring for that – Maybe you guys aren't ready to announce or or um, roll out, but that are really something that folks want. Yeah, and so, so there's a question, things that, that we haven't done yet that people have, have been asking for. Yeah, yeah, I think you said something to the effect of, yeah. like, we couldn't even do that. So what's what, yeah. are, what are some products that so, are just, like, way too far out there or a year away, two years away that, yeah. you know, are kind of just stay in, in a, not even an idea stage? Yeah, so one thing is, you know, a lot of people ask for, like, you know, why can't there be futures on, uh, you know, on everything? Why can't there be futures on? And then there'll be a lot of things that are, like, you know, stocks or something like that. And and the answer for a lot of these things is, actually, that's, that's a pretty highly regulated industry. That, uh, you know, in the United States and also globally, um, you know, there are sort of different regulatory roadmaps for different products. And that you know, we are to some extent constrained by that. And so, you know, when we're thinking about, uh, about can we launch Tesla futures, you know, I'm not an expert on that question. Sort of the, the initial readings on that have been like, you know, it's that that's going to be sort of a much bigger regulatory lift than anything we're doing right now. And I don't see, you know, we haven't seen like enough demand for that to justify trying to figure out a workable scheme for that. And so I think that's sort of one example of things. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of sort of small things that just take us a long time to, to churn out. And I think sort of one thing that happens often there is that lots of users will have requests, but they're not uh, consistent with each other. And, and one sort of cool example of this is for as long as FTX has existed, people have been asking for various tools to help them uh, calculate their P&L on their trades. Um, and this is something that's taken us like what, what seems from the outside and, and from the inside to some extent a shockingly long time to provide to people given that it seems like something a lot of people want and not very hard. Um, but what you sort of run into is that actually there are a lot of different ways to calculate P&L. And whatever we present, half of all people are going to get, you know, are going to feel like, what? That's not, that's saying I lost money, but I actually made money. And we're like, well, it depends on how you're marking things. And, and you, you can get into weird questions like, you deposit a Bitcoin and then you sell it for eight thousand dollars, and then Bitcoin goes to nine thousand dollars. Like, what's your P and L there? You know, are you like, did you lose on the fact that you sold that Bitcoin? Did it come out of nowhere? So you, you're not short. Like, how do you think about your, you know, net profit on, on that? Um, and 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 a lot of sort, of sort of other corner cases that turn out to matter. So, so that's one area where we've seen something like that coming up a lot. Um, but uh. But there are a bunch of other things, too. And I think, you know, one example is, do we want to just list futures on everything, you know, every crypto? Um, 
so, you know, we've listed features on a lot of things, a lot more than other places. You know, we've, we've listed it on probably 25 things or something like that. Um, you know, Bitcoin, ETH, EOS, XRC, but we also have Link and Dogecoin and, and Tomo futures. And, you know, we sort of went through a phase where we listed a bunch of those. Um, we, we haven't been listing as many and we, we're constantly getting requests for like, you know, can, can you list futures on, you know, Raven or, uh, you know, Ren or, or, or Die or something. And, you know, we're still thinking about it, but we slowed that down a lot. And part of the reason is that there's sort of this infinite list of coins. And, you know, we've already listed basically all, all the top ones. And, and for other things that we could list features on, there's a question of like, is this that there's actually a lot of demand to trade those futures? Is it like basically only one person? Or is a lot of people who might trade them if they existed, but they used to be trading those instead of some other similar future and not sort of feel strongly about it. And the cost of this is that it sort of strains lots of things that aren't obvious. You know, it strains the matching engine, but that's actually something that we've got mostly a, a handle on. And so we're not too worried about that. It's more that it just, increases the surface area of things that can go wrong. And, and you know, one thing is when, when sorry, I'm a user of an exchange, I have always sort of felt like it's there for me to trade if I want and not if I don't want. And I can look at the market and decide whether I want to trade. And if it's super liquid, maybe I'll trade. And if it's not, maybe I won't. But like, whatever it is, it isn't, that's fine. Um, but, you know, one thing that sort of was a, little, a lesson I had to learn was that's not how a lot of people see it, especially people who only trade on one venue they're really reliant on that. And so if, if you know you ever have an extremely liquid market, a lot of you know a lot of users will feel pretty unhappy about that because they'll feel like boy like I put in the effort to put my assets here to onboard here and now I can't trade because there's no liquidity um, and I really need to get some trade done. And uh, and so from that perspective, you know, we're pretty nervous about doing things that, you know, increase the odds of there being you know no liquidity in, in a market for a while. And, uh, and tons of things can happen that'll like randomly hit one future. You know, the exchanges that list that token all go down for maintenance at the same time. And then no one knows how to price and all the liquidity goes away. And that's the sort of thing where it happens pretty rarely, but if you have 30 tokens, you know, and if it's a fairly, on 30 tokens, if it's it, a fairly a liquid token, that's not traded on a lot of exchanges. You could run into that problem. Exactly. So it's maybe only listed on one or two real exchanges. So, yeah. What goes into the decision-making process behind building a future on top of a given crypto asset? You mentioned liquidity, yeah. number of exchanges it trades on. What else is there? Yeah. So one thing, maybe I'll talk about a few things that don't go into it as much as they do for other places. Um, and one of them is bullishness on it. If you're a spot exchange thinking of listing a coin, you're sort of really incentivized to list coins you think are going to go up and not coins you think are going to go down the opportunity you're offering your customers are to buy them. And you kind of don't want all your customers to lose money from something that's going down. Whereas for us, it's a futures platform where you can go long or short. Um, there's still some asymmetries here, but, but it's less sharp. And, you know, a really successful future might be one on a product that goes down a lot and gives customers an opportunity to, to short it. You know, as much as one that goes up a lot and gives, uh, you know, customers an opportunity to be long. So, you know, we're less looking at what do we think is going to go up or down when we list. Um, we also don't charge any sort of listing fees in any way. And so, you know, we don't see listing something as, you know, a one-off revenue generator. Um, what we're looking at basically is a combination of how liquid is it and how much volume will it trade on FTX. And that's really the bulk of what we care about. Um, and everything else is sort of secondary unless there's some some sort of weird, uh, you know, idiosyncratic red flag with it. Um, and, and so really what we're looking for is like, you know, how do we decide how much it's going to trade? Well, how much is it trading on existing markets? There's a big signal there, obviously. How much excitement do we see? How many customers want to trade it? You know, we'll sometimes put out polls of what to launch and, and that'll help inform, uh, you know, our decisions of what people are going to trade. We'll try and figure out like, do we think this is going to see sustained interest and volume from the cryptocurrency ecosystem? Or is it just a flash in the pan and, you know, the bar is higher for something we think is going to be just, you know, really inactive in a month. Um, and so, you know, really we're just sort of optimizing for like where is the interest and attention and excitement in crypto. And that's what we want to have futures on. You know, we want to have futures on the thing people want to be getting long or short. Um, 
And, you know, liquidity also helps a lot because it means that the markets are going to be a lot easier to trade, a lot easier to trade large size in, um, and, a, and a lot more pleasant to use. Other things that we look at, you know, we we don't want to list something that seems like really to have like some really, really big black mark. So, you know, if we if we had strong reason to think some token was basically a scam, um, you know, I think that we would feel pretty nervous about doing anything there, even though you could make the argument, great, list futures on it to let people short it. And I think that's a pretty reasonable argument. But, you know, we'd want to make sure that the way we're presenting this to customers was reasonable and that, you know, we by listing the future on it, people didn't take that as a signal that, you know, we're endorsing that as sort of a legitimate product. Um, if, if we're going down that route, and that, that's sort of a hard line to walk. So, you know, we're sort of worried about things like that. Um, we've uh, shied away from privacy coins somewhat for regulatory reasons. Um, and, and that's honestly something I should just look into. Um, I, I think there are real regulatory concerns with spot privacy coins. I think privacy coin futures probably much less worry, but I, I honestly haven't done the due diligence on that. So at some point I will. Um, and, uh, and you know, sort of a bunch of other idiosyncratic things that, that go in. But really the bulk of it is like, sure. what are people excited about? Sure. So, I mean, some of the coins though, right? I mean, when we think about the liquidity, um, you know, obviously trading in the millions, not the billions of, of, of trading volumes a day. Is there a concern that some of the tokens, I mean, you have about, as you said, 30 listed or 30 futures. Is there a concern that some of them might not have the liquidity to support a derivative contract? Yeah, there is, there is concern about that. And, you know, to some extent, you can say, well, what does that mean? You know, it'll be as liquid as the spot markets are. And however that li- liquid that is, you know, that's how liquid the futures will be, maybe a little more liquid. Um, and you know, what that means is if, you know, given that liquidity, some amount of volume is able to go up in spot markets, then, you know, we should be able to get similar things in futures with a similar amount of liquidity. So you can try and make that argument. I think it sort of holds up. I think the place it breaks down is liquidation. Um, the real thing to worry about for futures liquidity in particular is that you don't get into death spirals of liquidation where, uh, you know, one user gets liquidated, sells off, triggers another liquidation, and you just get this like downward spiral where everyone's getting liquidated and no one no one wants to sell, but everyone's forced to now. Um, and and so you sort of have to make sure that there's enough liquidity that it can support the sorts of positions people are going to want to put on without just imploding too quickly. Um, and, you know, obviously that depends on how big of a position people are putting on too. Um, It's a little bit of a fine line, and I think we've sort of, you know, we haven't had massive liquidity breakdowns in any of our, caused by by our exchange in any of our uh, products, although, you know, we have listed futures on, you know, Matic, for instance. We have Matic futures, and Matic obviously had a day where where it it had a pretty bad day a couple months ago. Yeah, Um, down uh, down 60%. Yes, yes, markets were sort of fine through that to the extent that you could be fine through it while the coin's going down 80% or whatever, but... But, but I think that's sort of about as, I think, any less liquid than that. And I think we'd sort of be pushing, you know, tempting fate too but much. But that was kind of, that was um, an interesting, so sort of, that was kind of an interesting test case. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, it absolutely was. And I think that's sort of the thing we're trying to avoid is having something like that happen on FTX. And, you know, I'm, I'm pretty worried that it would if we listed things substantially less liquid than, than the least liquid things we have there. Now, and I'm even worried about listing like too many more things on that level. Um, and so I think we're sort of like, you know, we, we kept listing less and less liquid things until we sort of started to get a little bit nervous and then we're sort of backing off. And, and so I think we sort of reached the point where we don't feel comfortable listing, listing, you know, futures on things less liquid than, than you know, Dogecoin, for instance. Mm-hmm. So if, if 2020 is going to be a bit about a more conservative approach less about listing as many products as possible or rolling out as many products as possible. What is going to define 2020 for FTX or at FTX? Yeah. So I think it's going to be rather than listing a lot of new markets for futures, it's going to be a few things. One of them is a growth of different types of derivative and tokenized products. So 
you know, you saw the options rollout was one step of that, and we're going to put a lot more into that as well. We're sort of continually making that a more robust and, and developed product. Um, but we're going to do a lot of other, uh, you know, sort of generalized ways of, uh, you know, basically thinking about using trading, um, you know, various trading strategies, tokenization of various uh, cryptocurrency uh, trades and assets and positions, um, and uh, and sort of more more details will will be coming out in the next month or so about this. Mm-hmm. Um, but but I think we're going to be leaning in a lot to the uh, you know sort of the meta product space, like thinking about you know leverage tokens as an example of tokenizing uh, sort of tokenizing trades. Um, and uh, but there's sort of a much broader field there, and uh, and so I think we're going to do a lot of work on that. And, and probably also work on more derivatives products. You know, we have futures, we have options. We're probably going to list, you know, VIX um, and, and, and other volatility products. You know, we have Move. Um, so that's another thing. Uh, it's going to be fiat on ramps. We're going to be working on a lot. Um, we're going to be obviously doing a lot of outreach to users to try and grow the platform as much as possible. Um, and then I would expect to see some expansion from FTX as well. Um, and that's, something that, you know, hopefully we'll have more details about over the next, uh, you know, couple weeks and months. But uh, I'm pretty excited about the directions that that it's going to be going. Uh, But it's going to be a lot more about building out the types of products it has and a lot less about, you know, building out the number of coins it has futures on. Sam, we covered a lot of territory, a lot of ground. Um, I think, or at least I hope, listeners will come out of this with a better understanding, a better grasp of the activity going on in the derivatives market, how what is developing in Asia might be different from what's happening here in the U S and of course the, the outlook you have for FTX itself for the next year. Thank you so much for coming on. Hope to chat with you soon. And I hope you get some rest at some point. It's 4 AM right now for you. (laughs) Yeah, I think it's it's about nap time for me. So uh, anyway, thank you. Uh, Thank you so much for having me. This was fun as always. Yes. Thanks so much, Sam. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of The Scoop. We hope you tune in next time. And don't forget to subscribe and favorite wherever you listen to your podcasts. We'd like to take a minute to thank our sponsor, Cash App. Cash App has been the number one finance app on the App Store for almost two years. It was also the first major peer-to-peer payments app to support Bitcoin, and it's still the fastest and easiest way to turn cash into crypto. Cash App now supports Bitcoin deposits in-app, so be sure to move your Bitcoin from whatever wallet you're using to Cash App. Don't have any to deposit? Cash App is also the most convenient way to instantly buy and sell Bitcoin. No more waiting five days for your ACH transfers to come through. With Cash App, you can buy Bitcoin instantly. When you're ready to take full ownership of your private keys, just use Cash App to scan an external wallet's QR code. It's really that simple. Cash App also comes with standard banking features like direct deposits and others your bank would never even consider, like Cash Card, a customizable debit card that lets you instantly save every time you use it at Lyft, Whole Foods, and places like Chick-fil-A. Download Cash App today from the App Store or Google Play 